I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to Just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Join me on the second verse. Through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. those who know Savannah, you know even standing up there was really hard for her to do. You did incredible, Savannah. Good job. Yeah. Yes, we're all proud of you, baby. So. Testing with that one. Can you hear me now? All right. Today's Discussion is, is a, pardon the pun, a hot topic. Um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding what happens with hellfire. Is it burning right now? Is it future? Is it past? Um, and it's, it's an important topic to understand correctly because what we view about death and hell colors our picture of who God is. So let's pray and we'll get right in. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to share this topic and for the opportunity to study it, and all the people here who are wanting to hear your message. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Forgive me of mine. Make me just a vessel, a mouthpiece. May Christ in him crucified be all that is seen. And even though we're all Adventists here, please help us to understand this even more. And those who may be watching online, even them, to help understand better. Be with us, Lord, in your name, amen. So why do I call it the gospel of hell? I've gone over this topic many times with, with my live streams and studies and things like that, and occasionally there will be somebody who is just looking at me like a deer in the headlights because they don't understand what hellfire has to do with the gospel. Well, Paul talks about what the gospel is in Corinthians, and he says that it is that Jesus died for us, he rose again for us, and he, he did all of that for us, and he's continuing to work for us. That is the gospel. But the Bible says that there is more to it than just that. In Revelation 14, as we read in the scripture reading, the three angels' messages are the gospel as well, in prophetic terms, with a prophetic viewpoint. In verse 6, it says, I saw another angel flying through the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. And then by the third angel, the third angel mentions the topic of hellfire. And that makes it that, that the doctrine of hellfire is part of the gospel message. Now, if the gospel is about Jesus and who he is and what he did for us, that means hellfire points to Jesus, who he is, and what he did for us. There are many different theories. In the Greek underworld, the 
their their religious belief system in the ancient times was that basically and when you died, you crossed to the River Styx, you kind of, everybody went to the same place. Hades, or, uh, and if you're Roman, I think it was Pluto, was the god of the, of the underworld. And it wasn't necessarily so much a place of burning as much as it was just eternal misery kind of place. There's the popular Christian view, which is a paganized version, uh, or a Christianized version of the pagan view, and that is the idea that hellfire is burning for all eternity. That Adam and Eve, um, not Adam and Eve, sorry, but um, like Cain and Abel and Hitler and all of them, they're all suffering the same penalty, even though their sins are vastly different. But what's interesting is that even in the Christian world, there's still different theories all claiming to be Christian. One of the Christian views is that there's a two-compartment underworld, one called Abraham's bosom and one called Sheol. Um, a lot of people will also say that Abraham's bosom is also known as paradise. They say that paradise and heaven are two different places. And this is just one of the theories. And of course, the Bible doesn't support this theory, but still. There's the Egyptian theory of um, when you die. And this was a very common belief throughout pretty much all of paganism, but the Egyptians had their own spin on it. And basically, when you died, you were faced with a judge and a scale. If you know the scale where it's kind of a two sided and your good deeds were placed on one side and your bad deeds were placed on the other side. And, and based on whichever one was heavier, that determined where you were going in the afterlife. And of course, that's not a glitch. That's an on purpose, this slide. There's the atheist view in which they believe nothing at all happens. You die, you're dead for eternity. There is no judgment. There is no God to answer to. And so there are, of course, many different theories. And then there is, of course, the one where we believe in this denomination that we believe is the biblical view, and that is that even that the wicked and even the earth itself will be burned to ashes. So what is the big deal? Why is this such an important topic? And this is kind of the danger of almost what makes me nervous in speaking a, a, a sermon to an already uh, Adventist congregation of the danger of going in one ear and out the other, and I pray that's not what happens today, but um, what is the big deal? Why do, we, why do we preach on this topic within this church? And the big deal is that God's reputation is on the line. How we view hellfire is how we're going to view God. You see, in these times that are coming, the, the time of trouble is getting closer and closer and closer, and when the hammer drops... Everybody in the world is going to act out their picture of who God is. And if you believe in God as a merciful Savior, one who does not torture sinners for all eternity, that's how you're going to act. But if you believe in a God who's tyrannical and burns sinners for all eternity, that's how you're going to act. You see, what Jesus did for us on the cross is intricately tied into this topic. He made forever certain that death and hell will forever be destroyed. And when we say hell, it's the Greek word for gospel, not gospel, but grave. And as we saw in our scripture reading, the three angels' message lists a, a several different doctrines that fall under the umbrella of the gospel. And hellfire is specifically listed here because of the fact that God is love. The Bible says it twice in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, that God is love. What was Satan's big claim in, in heaven when he was conducting his rebellion before he was kicked out and fell to earth? What was Satan's big claim? That God is what? <laughs> that God, Satan wasn't claiming that God is love. That's, he was claiming the opposite. That God is unfair. That God is a tyrant. That he is unjust. Right? That his law cannot possibly be obeyed. And that's kind of where we come from in this church, a unique perspective. That's why we preach the great controversy the way that we do, because everything that we believe and teach here should show that God is love. See, the, the idea of an eternally burning hell is predicated on the belief of an immortal soul. But what does the Bible say about that topic? The Bible says in Genesis 2 verse 7 that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. Now what's interesting is that this word in the Greek, uh, the, the word for soul, 
is nefesh, and it means literally a breathing creature or a being. So when Adam was created, did Adam receive a creature separate from his body? Did, did he receive an Adam separate from Adam? So here the Bible is telling us that we have an equation. We have body plus breath equals life. It's not Adam was created and Adam received a spirit that was bound to his body until he died. It was Adam became a living soul, a living creature. So we don't have souls that are bound to our bodies that depart at death. We are souls. And Revelation 16 and other scriptures also go on to say that anything that is a breathing creature is a breathing soul. It's not something separate from the body. We are living souls. And Ecclesiastes 12 gives us the opposite formula. Where in Genesis 2 verse 7 we have the, the formula of addition equals something. In Ecclesiastes 7 we have the formula of subtraction. Our bodies will return to the dust of the earth and the breath of life will go back to God who gave it to us. Now, a lot of people will read the scripture in like the King James Version or another version. And don't get me wrong, I love the King James Version. But they'll, they'll seize on that and, and because it says spirit in the King James and they won't dig deeper. The, the Good News Bible actually translates this scripture more accurately when it says the breath of life. The word spirit means breath of life. So body minus breath equals dead, right? When you die, you're not going anywhere. The Bible goes on to say in Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So this is God speaking to Adam and Eve, and he's letting them know the consequences of their sin. Eve, this is your consequence. Serpent, Satan, this is your consequence. Adam, here's your consequence. And the consequence for all of them was, eventually, you're going to die. And does this verse say, Adam, when you die, you're going to appear in heaven with me? Does it say, Adam and Eve, when you die, you're going to this new place I've invented where you're going to burn for all eternity? He says, no, Adam, when you die, you're going back to the dust. You were created from dust. You're going back to dust. Patriarchs and prophets in commenting on this as Adam witnessed the widespread corruption that was finally to cause the destruction of the world by a flood. And though the sentence of death pronounced upon him by his maker had at first appeared terrible, yet after beholding for nearly a thousand years the results of sin, he felt that it was merciful in God to bring an end of life of suffering and sorrow. You see, it is in mercy to us that God allows us to die. Because how do you think Adam and Eve would feel if they were still alive witnessing the degradation that sin has brought this world to in the 21st century? The Great Controversy says, In mercy to the world, God blotted out its wicked inhabitants in Noah's time. In mercy, He destroyed the corrupt dwellers in Sodom. Through the deceptive power of Satan, the workers of iniquity obtained sympathy and admiration and are thus constantly leading others to rebellion. It was so in Cain's and in Noah's day. It was so in the time of Abraham and Lot. It is so in our time. Now, 110 years later, after she wrote this book, it's still that way, is it not? It is in mercy to the universe that God will finally destroy the rejectors of His grace. You see, the fact that God will destroy sinners and not torture them for eternity is as much for the good of the universe as is our salvation. In mercy to us, God allows us and our loved ones to rest in death, not to be taken immediately to heaven or hellfire. Job knew this when he said, but man dies and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fell from the sea, and the flood decays and dries up, so man lies down and rises not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. So here Job, and this is generally accepted as being one of the earliest books written. Job is letting us know death is asleep. And Job in one of his prayers to God, he says, Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would keep me in secret until your wrath be passed, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. So Job, if you remember the story of Job, he was really going through it. I mean, he lost everything except for his wife. 
And even his wife was, a th was kind of a thorn in his side at one point because she says, Job, you should just curse God and die. It's not worth it anymore. And so Job was praying to God. He said, Lord, please just let me die. Because he knew that in the grave he would have rest. He wouldn't be beholding his loved ones anymore after that. He just, he just, he wanted rest. Solomon tells us the same thing that Job did in Ecclesiastes 9. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you are going. So is Solomon leaving us any room for doubt here? Solomon here, when you die, you're dead. Like, there's no caveat here. I see so many people commenting on my videos and whatnot about saying, well, this was Solomon. He was just, he was just, you know, he was a depressed king, and he, he was just writing this. This really isn't how it goes. Um, I actually had someone tell me that when Paul wrote this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that, well, Paul was just being nice. It really doesn't work that way. And it's kind of crazy how people will resort to different tactics just to avoid what the truth is. In, in Psalm 115, the Bible says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. How miserable would you be if you had died and gone to heaven and you're watching your family still suffer, right? I, I've lost so many people in my life. I've lost all of my grandparents. I've lost um, my mom, my dad, my stepdad. They're, they're all gone. I've, we've, lost, we've had two miscarriages. We've lost a lot of people. And, and, and how miserable would they be if they were watching us, knowing the trials that my family's going through right now? And it just... How could you honestly call God a God of love if that's what he allowed? How could you be happy if you were sitting in heaven watching your family make decisions against Jesus? In the Great Controversy, page 545, How utterly revolting is the belief that as soon as the breath leaves the body, the soul of the impenitent is consigned to the flames of hell. To what depths of anguish must those be plunged who see their friends passing to the grave unprepared, to enter upon an eternity of woe and sin. Many have been driven to insanity by this harrowing thought. And this is one of the reasons that I preach so passionately against the doctrine of eternal hellfire and the immortal soul. Because so many people, just as it says, they've gone literally gone crazy because of the idea of if they don't accept Jesus, he's going to burn them for all eternity. There's no relief in the eternal hellfire. And there's different theories. People say, well, your skin melts off and then it comes back and you have to do it all over again. And there's different theories about uh, how hell is and none of them can agree with each other. And there's, it's just, it, it's a doctrine of demons. See, why a sermon about this here? Because God's reputation is on the line. We have people coming in various congregations around the world that are unsure of this topic, right? I, I met a guy in Chicago years ago when we lived in Illinois. Um, there was a gentleman in his ministry. It's called the Forerunner Chronicles. And at the time, I don't know if he's still doing it, but at the time he was going around to different cities and they were passing out the great controversy. And we lived about an hour away from Chicago at the time, so I heard he was coming to Chicago and I went down to, to help out so I could help share the book. And I met a man named Eric and he and I went through Chicago that day and just handing out the great controversy and come to find out he was a former Catholic and this was the doctrine that brought him to the truth. Somebody was showing him what happens in death and, and that hell is not eternal and he was like, you've got to be kidding me. And through that doctrine he learned everything else and he joined this church. Now the Bible doesn't deny the fact that there is such a thing as everlasting burnings. But notice this, Isaiah 33, and if you really want to kind of blow someone's mind, this is the text to use. It says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Why are the sinners afraid? Why are they afraid? Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? And notice that the Bible answers its own question. When we study the Bible, we have to be very careful not to put in our own opinion. The Bible answers its question. He that walketh 
righteously and speaks uprightly. He that despises the gain of oppressions, he that shakes his hands from holding bribes, those who refuse to be bribed. He that stops his ears from hearing of blood and shuts his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king and his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. So why are the sinners afraid? Because they know the fire is coming, and they know they're not going to survive it. But the righteous are excited because they know that through this experience of sanctification, through that experience of walking with God, they've been made fireproof. Why do we have to be made fireproof? Exodus 24 says that the Lord is a devouring fire. This is Exodus 24, 17. Deuteronomy 4, 24. The Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 9, verse 3. The Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, verses 20 and 29. For our God is a consuming fire. The New King James translates all these as everlasting fire or everlasting burnings. I'm sorry, not the New King James, but the King James. Um, so the sinners know that God is coming. They, they know that the Bible says that, that sinners cannot, dis, sinners cannot um, survive the presence of a holy God. Nahum chapter 1, uh, verses 9 and 10 tells us this way, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction or sin shall not rise a second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, while they are drunk as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. So what does an utter mean to make an utter end? Well, in the Hebrew, this means to make a full end, complete destruction, annihilation. So many people will, will look at the doctrine that we teach in this church and they'll say, well, annihilation isn't biblical. Well, here's the very word that means annihilation being used here to describe the destruction of the wicked. Now, the words folden means interwoven. When, when uh, the house that we were living in before we moved... When we first moved there, I was going around the backyard cutting tree limbs out because there was so much shade uh, that the grass wasn't growing properly. It wasn't getting enough sun. Of course, that wasn't the only reason. The previous owners had dogs, but you know, that's beside the point. But I was cutting down all these tree limbs that had grown over, to, over our fence line, and I piled them on top of each other, and then I discovered when I tried to pull one apart that they had become interconnected. They had become interwoven. So you couldn't just move one tree branch anymore because when you pulled the one, it would start pulling the whole pile. And so God here is letting us know that the wicked will be destroyed altogether. It won't just be an isolated instance. It's not going to be Cain died 5,000 years ago, so he's been burning that long. And Hitler died around 80, 90 years ago, whenever it was. And uh, so he's been burning, just not for as long. It's the Bible tells us all the wicked are going to be destroyed at the same time. And the word devour does mean devour. There's nothing fancy here. The Bible says exactly what it means. And I've heard people say, well, Jesus taught on hell more than any other topic. Well, one, no, he didn't. He taught about the kingdom of heaven more than anything else. But people will point to Jesus and say, well, he taught the hell's eternal. Well, let's look at what Jesus actually said. In John 5, he says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. Uh, they that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So at what point of human history did Jesus come as a human? It was about 4,000 years in, right? And now we're pushing 6,000 years, but back then it was 4,000 years. And so Jesus here is saying that, that they that are in the graves will hear his voice. And this is future tense. So if, if there was such a thing as eternal hell, why didn't Jesus say that um, they that have done evil are already in hell burning? Why didn't he say that they that have done good are already in heaven re, you know, with their eternal reward? In John 11, as we saw in the children's story, Jesus taught the same thing. Jesus, uh, his, his friends, Mary and Martha, sent the message, Lazarus is sick, and they expected him to come right away. And Jesus couldn't come right away because he had to let Lazarus die because, as the desire of ages says, that was his greatest miracle that he had saved. If Jesus went right away, Lazarus would not have died. Death is not possible in the presence of Jesus, right? So he told his disciples after a couple days, he said, Lazarus is asleep, let's go wake him up. 
and his disciples misunderstood him and said, well, if he's sleeping, right, if you've ever gotten sick, you know you get exhausted and all you want to do is sleep. So his disciples were, well, he's, he'll be fine. He'll get better if he's taking rest. And Jesus had to let them know plainly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus taught that death is asleep, that nobody receives a reward when they die. It takes you know, until the end of time. There are different words used for hell in the Greek. There's the word Hades, which means grave, which is used 11 times in the New Testament. There's the word Gehenna, which is used 12 times in the New Testament. And the word Gehenna means a place of burning. However, it's interesting that Jesus chose this word to use because Gehenna was actually a trash dump outside of Jerusalem. They would take their trash, maybe some dead animals, things like that, and they would kind of pile it all in the same spot same valley and it was a place of continual burning now are those trash heaps still burning I mean, the obvious answer is no right and there's the other word to use is tartaru i probably mispronounced that but you know there it is and it simply means a, to to incarcerate it refers to a place of darkness and it's the only time um, it's only used once in the entire bible now if the bible doesn't teach eternal hellfire where did it come from one of the popular, uh, not popular necessarily, but one of the avenues that came through was Tertullian. He said, if anyone shall violently suppose that destruction of the soul and flesh and hell amounts to final annihilation of the two substances and not to their penal treatment, let him recollect that the fire of hell is eternal, expressly announced as an everlasting penalty. Let him admit that it is from this circumstance that this never-ending killing is more formidable than a merely human murder, which is only temporal. So it came through these different philosophers, these different theologians, this idea of an eternally burning hell. Jonathan Edwards also said, The view of the misery of the damned will double the ardor of the love and gratitude of the saints in heaven. So tell me, where, where is that found in the Bible? Right? He, he, he's supposing here that us seeing hell burning forever is what will increase our love for God. Well, my friends, if we are dependent on the doctrine of eternal hellfire, to increase our love for God or to, to avoid sin, then, then, then that's, that's paganism. That's not Christianity. The Bible says that it's the love of Christ that compels us. It's not the doctrine of eternal hellfire. Plato said, every soul is immortal. Right? This, so this, this idea of the immortal soul, this idea of eternal hellfire, came through various pagan philosophers and through various um, theologians that eventually gave rise to, you know, uh, Catholicism in the Dark Ages, but it didn't come from the Bible. In the Old Testament, the spirits of the dead played a major part in Babylonian religion. This, is, this quote is from, um, I think it was the last Sabbath school lesson that we did on death and hell last year, or the year before. This is where that quote's from. The Babylonians had a strong belief in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. They believed at death that the soul entered the spirit world. The concept of the immortal soul is foreign to the teachings of Scripture, though. The Jewish encyclopedia clearly identifies the origin of the false idea of the immortality of the soul. It says, The belief that the soul continues its existence after the dissolution of the body is nowhere expressly taught in Holy Scripture. The belief in the immortality of the soul came to the Jews from contact with Greek thought and chiefly through the philosophy of Plato, its principal exponent, who, has, who was led to it through Orphic and Eleusinian mysteries in which Babylon and Egyptian views were strangely blended. So, Essentially, what happened was when the church of the early uh, times after Jesus ascended, when it started compromising about 100 years after his ascension, these beliefs started coming in. We talked about it a little bit during Sabbath school, about how the church, in order to increase numbers, started saying, it's okay, you don't have to change your beliefs. You don't have to stop worshiping your gods. We'll just change their names to different names of different saints. You're, you're not worshiping Zeus anymore. You're worshiping Peter now. You're not praying to, to, to Paul now, you're praying to Jupiter now. Um, and one of the ideas was, you know, you don't have to give up your belief in eternal hell. We, you know, just come to church. Uh, and, and really, it was a way to, for the church to make more money, is what it was. Now, a lot of people will point to Jude chapter 1 verse 7. It says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so they'll see that phrase, eternal fire, and they'll say, see, it's eternal. 
Well, let's let the Bible explain itself. Let's let the Bible do the defining here. The Bible says in 2 Peter 2, verse 6, what eternal fire means. It says, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should after live ungodly. So instead of inserting our own opinions here, let's let the Bible define itself and explain itself. In the great controversy, what would be gained to God should we admit that he delights in witnessing unceasing tortures, that he is regaled with the groans and shrieks and imprecations of the suffering creatures whom he holds in the flames of hell? Can these horrid sounds be music in the air of infinite love? It is urged that the infliction of endless misery upon the wicked would show God's hatred of sin as an evil which is ruinous to the peace and order of the universe. Dreadful blasphemy, she calls it. This false doctrine of hellfire, she calls blasphemy. As if God's hatred of sin is the reason why it is perpetuated. Why would you subject yourself to something you hate doing? Right? My, my, my daughter, she hates doing the dishes. I, I, don't, I don't blame her. I hate doing the dishes. And, um, you know... We, we tell her, you know, the sooner you get it done, the sooner it's over, and the sooner the, that unpleasant experience is done, right? Why would God perpetuate the suffering of the wicked for all eternity? Because he hates sin. It just doesn't make sense. For according to the teachings of these theologians, continued torture without hope of mercy maddens its wretched victims as they pour out their rage and curses and blasphemy. They are forever augmenting their load of guilt. God's glory is not enhanced by thus perpetuating continually increasing sin through ceaseless ages. This idea of eternal hellfire is such a smear on God's reputation because God is love. He's not going to extend something that he hates. It just doesn't make sense, and it's not biblical. Now, a lot of people will point to Revelation 20, verse 10, because it says that, that uh, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, this phrase um, is, is very interesting, forever and ever. The word and is not actually in the Greek. It's, it's just forever, ever. And the word for means for, but it also refers to place or time. So everything in this phrase is referring to time. The word ever uh, I believe it's the word Ionios, and it means an age or a period of time. So God is letting us know here that, yes, the devil's going to burn. His demons are going to burn. Everyone who's served Satan and not repented are going to burn. The Bible doesn't deny that fact. But it is only going to be for a period of time. And the word tormented here in the Revelation is a future tense, meaning they're not burning now. And the word means to test purity or gold. Paul actually talks about it as well. But if we let the Bible explain itself, you see so many people focus on verse 10, and they leave verse 9 completely out of the picture, where it says that fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Have you ever tried to burn something that's, that's dry, right? Earlier we read in Nahum that it says that the wicked will be destroyed as stubble fully dry. Have you ever tried to burn wet wood? You, you guys are camping. Have you ever tried to burn wet wood? How well does that work? It doesn't. Not very well. But what about dry wood? What happens if you set dry wood on fire? How quickly does dry wood burn? <laughs> Immediately. The houses that are constructed today are constructed way differently than they were back then. And that's not a dig on construction, but it is to say that the materials used now, houses burn so much quicker than they used to. If we're still trying to sell our house, and if it were to catch on fire, it's, it would go up like smoke just because of the materials it's made of. It is beyond the power of the human mind to estimate the evil which has been wrought by the heresy of eternal torment. The religion of the Bible, full of love and goodness and abounding in compassion, is darkened by superstition and clothed with terror. Satan will do anything he can to turn people away from Jesus, and this doctrine of eternal fire is one of those. When we consider what false co when, let me start when we consider in what false colors Satan has painted the character of God, can we wonder that our merciful Creator is feared, dreaded, and even hated? 
the appalling views of God which we have spread over the world from the teachings of the pulpit have made thousands, just millions of skeptics and infidels. It's another reason why I preach so passionately against the doctrine of eternal hellfire because so many people have said, yeah, I'm going to be an atheist. I cannot believe in a God who tortures sinners for all eternity. Yeah, me, me neither. I, I refuse to believe in a God who would torture people for all eternity simply because they don't accept Him. That's just not who God is. In Romans 5, the Bible tells us why God wants to save us. God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So, why does God save us? Because He loves us. You know, this is one of my favorite verses because it says, while we were His enemies, it goes on to say, if, if when we were His enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved through His life. You see, um, the, the, the idea that God is love automatically excludes all of these false ideologies, the idea of eternal hell, the idea of, of well, all, all of the different heresies that people come up with. You see, God's destruction of the wicked is just as much because He loves them as the fact that He saves the righteous because He loves them. So, the fact that, that um, in Great Controversy it says, Could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven and witness the high and holy state of perfection there? Um, she goes on to say, Could they endure the glory of God? No, they, could, they couldn't. They would be begging to be um, taken away from, they says they would long to flee from the holy place. If God were allowed sinners to have eternal life in heaven, they would be miserable. It would be a worse form of hell for them than just being destroyed in the lake of fire. You see, the idea of eternal hell is, is something that is not biblical and pushes people away from God. And, and it's for the purpose of evangelism that we have to understand this properly because Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when you have made him, you make him twofold the child of hell than yourselves. So many people, and I've seen it online. I, I do videos on Instagram and TikTok all the time, and I've seen videos where people say, Well, well, hellfire, um, people believing in eternal hellfire, means that uh, you know there have been studies made that they... They don't commit as many crimes. They don't sin as much. Well, yeah, because they're terrified of eternal hell. They're terrified that God's going to make them suffer for all eternity. Who wouldn't try to obey a tyrannical God in order to avoid suffering? That's not biblical, though. And the Bible tells us in many different places, for the sake of time, I'm just going to try and go quickly here, but he says, don't seek unto them that have familiar spirits. Don't go to the wizards. Don't go to the witches. This, the, the penalty for doing so back then was death, and the reason for that was because when you think you're communicating with the dead, who are you really communicating with? Right. If you think you're com communicating with your dead grandma, who are you really communicating with? Satan. Satan himself. And for those who haven't read his books, I highly recommend Roger Marno. He talks about this and will blow your mind. It's incredible. Regard not them that have familiar spirits. Don't go to them that have familiar spirits. You see, it may seem like a dust statement to say, but there are, I have met Adventists who still get involved in certain forms of spiritualism by either, you know, watching Disney movies or, or looking up their daily horoscope, things like that. And, and, and these are connected with the doctrine that we're talking about today. And one of the important reasons that we shouldn't believe in, in, in the uh, immortality of the soul or the doctrine of hellfire uh, and that we should preach against those doctrines is found in the great controversy. It says, through these two great errors, these two, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. When we believe in the idea of an immortal soul, that opens the door for Satan to come and appear as dead loved ones. And it has happened through many times in history. Uh, Doug Basher has told stories that he knows. Um, I've seen uh, many people on, on, on social media 
say that, well, I died and, and I was on my way to hell and then I cried out to Jesus and he saved me from going all the way there. And, and the, the people will, will point to my videos and they'll say, well, well, what about these people who say they've gone to hell or have gone to heaven and seen Jesus? Um, well, and, and to that I say, well, one, there are different ways that it could happen. If you have a lack of oxygen to your brain, you're going to hallucinate. But also, your subconscious will show you what you already believe. Right? Well, where we live in a country like this, where Christianity is dominant, even an atheist who has an out-of-body experience is going to see something like eternal hell, because that's the common belief in, in our culture. But in other cultures across the world, people who, die, who, who say that they've had an out-of-body experience over there will see like whatever gods of the cultures that, that are over there, heart, um, Buddha or Krishna or whoever they are. You know, the, the, the character of God is on the line, is really what this boils down to. Um, and it's such an important topic to understand properly. And we have on the, on the table out there in the foyer, we have these, these shareables that um, talk about death and hell. So if you want an easy way to share this truth with others, they're out there for you to take. Um, so... It's, it's just important that, that God's reputation not be smeared. Our, our closing hymn is, I think, 499 is what we decided on. What a friend we have in Jesus.